Welcome everybody, welcome to Peace Day. It's great to be here with you. Uh, it doesn't seem that long ago that I was a One Young World delegate for the first time looking up at the stage with genuine awe in my eyes and I'm so humbled to be here with women who give me courage, give me solace and inspire me, but to talk about some difficult things. Uh, we are all here in freedom in Belfast, but that is not the case for women around the world. Um, one year ago, there were the protests in, in Iran. Two years before that, um, the Afghan administration fell. But the news cycle has moved on. We don't read about this in the headlines every day. So I'd just like to ask our panelists, for those of you who might not know what's happening in Iran and Afghanistan, to just set the scene. So what is it like, uh, Hasina, for women in Afghanistan today? What, what is the situation for them? Thank you very much, Ella. Good morning to everyone. Uh, before setting the um, set to information about Afghanistan, I would like to present my heartly gratitudes on behalf of the women of Afghanistan to Kate, Ella, David, and all the One Young World team. Thank you very much for the confidence. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot to us. I think this is what the world needs to do. Uh, last time, if you remember, I came to the stage weeping. Today, I'm coming to the stage with an idea of practice. So imagine the measurement from last year to this year. That is power, strength, hope, and opportunity. Thank you, well, One Young World, again. Thank you. Uh, to be very brief about the uh, situation of women in Afghanistan, starting from the social affairs, which is going to school, um, uh, going to a saloon, uh, appearing on TV, uh, working in an office. Uh, it has all stopped uh, politically and also socially, culturally. As a result of the 40 years and 20 years of war, there is a big number of widows in female-headed households who are imprisoned within their own houses and within their own rooms. Almost on weekly and monthly, bi-weekly basis, there is a directive of women not being able to going to saloons, not being able to going to um, for uh, parks, uh, for mobility. Uh, without any doubt, there is a very, very clear, visible gap within the present de facto structure, there is no vision for the women of Afghanistan, socially, culturally, traditionally, and politically. In what they are aiming in relation to religion, that is not the religion of Islam. The religion of Islam, the, word, the first word of the religion is Iqra. It does not say man read or women read. It says read. So that is just a hypocrisy. What I would like to say, there is no life for the women in Afghanistan, specifically those women who have struggled, who are educated, and who wanted to be dependent on themselves within their context, but not depend on others. And what I would like here is to please, the way One Young World committed to the promise they did last year, I urge each of you, to remember and talk about the women of Afghanistan, the children of Afghanistan. They deserve to be happy. They deserve to live the way they want to live. Women of Afghanistan, especially the working women, the educated women, the women who fought for freedom and democracy are imprisoned today in their own rooms, in their own houses, in their own communities, and in their own society. They need our help to voice out their messages and help them, because Afghanistan is a part of the body of the global world. Thank you, Ella. Thank you, Hasina. Yeah. Um, and Nazanin, one, one year ago, there was some hope. We thought that maybe after um, Marcel Hermini's senseless, brutal murder and the protest that we saw, that maybe it was a moment of change. 
Um, but those of you who have been following the news, there's been another brutal beating of a woman in Afghanistan, uh, excuse me, in Iran by, by the police this week. What, what's the situation like in Iran now and what should we understand about it? First of all, thank you, Ella. Thank you to One Young World. Just weeks after the Islamic Republic President Raisi was platformed at the UN General Assembly, it's pivotal that we have these conversations and platform dissident voices, so thank you. Um, so just to set the stage, uh, Iranian women run, won the right to vote eight years before the women of Switzerland. So before 1979, Iran was quite progressive when it came to women's rights. And, you know, there was a lot of progress happening. In 1979, there was an Islamic revolution, quote unquote, Islamic revolution. And the, the, the theocracy took uh, hold. And what happened was, you know, basically religion and state fused. And one example of how women's rights were systematically stripped away was that legal age of marriage w was lowered from 18 for women to nine. And girls that young can still get, be married in Iran today. That's just one example. Women have half the value of a man in a court of law. Um, there's, it's not now just the, uh, the issue of compulsory hijab. It's far beyond that. Women can't enter sports arenas. They can't ride a bicycle. They have to sit at the back of the bus. They're segregated from men in classrooms, at beaches, um, in some uh, government workplaces. And th there are many layers to this. Their inheritance and um, other rights are, are half the value of a man. And what happened when Massa, 22-year-old Massa Amini, was killed by the morality police for supposedly for inappropriate hijab was that this young woman, she wasn't just a young woman, she was a member of um, ethnic and religious minority groups, persecuted minority groups. So what happened was she, her killing, her brutal killing, galvanized Iranian society at large to understand the intersectionality of women's rights and every other basic human right. So it ignited a pro-democracy uprising. And there have been protests nearly once every decade in Iran since 1979. People have risen up to demand change. But what makes this time different, it different is that they just want an end to this theocracy. They want, a, they want a secular democracy. And when I hear about the women of Afghanistan, what bonds us is that we both have gender apartheid states. And so really our, our battle is won. And when I saw the rise of the Taliban two years ago, I remember, well, I, my parents' generation remember well in 1979 how the rights of women were systematically taken away and stripped away. And that's what we're seeing in Afghanistan, and our plight is really one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nazanin, in, in Iran, these brave protesters who've been standing up for, for their rights, and they are rights, these are not um, favours from men that women live freely. These are our rights. They have been so bravely protesting, but the crackdown has been brutal. And there is not enough international outcry about the conditions they're experiencing in detention. Now, you obviously incredibly unjustly experienced detention in Iran for six years. What are these women experiencing, and why should our audience be, be so angry about that? Uh, well, thank you for inviting me today. Um, when I was in prison, there were so many women in the general ward who um, had simply been standing up for the rights of having access to education. Uh, they were protesting their basic rights of unemployment, uh, protecting the environment. Like every, everything in Iran could be political. Protecting the environment could be a political act. Um, standing up for your right not to have like as a Baha'i um, person, you don't have access to education, higher education in Iran, that could be a, a, a political act. And there were so many women in prison when I was inside prison that have been given prolonged years of sentence just because they were standing up for their rights. So I, uh, I had the, uh, the privilege of being with some really incredible women. And I also had witnessed some of them, the two Baha'i women who have been released after 10 years and then when I was released, they came back to prison for with another 10 years. So this is a government that could lock you up, completely destroy your life, economy, reputation, dignity, and everything just for your basic right. So this is basically, the, my experience of the, of the general ward was there were so many women who have been in prison without one single day out. We had a, a woman who's, um, 
uh, Maria Macberry, whose um, siblings were uh, part of the, um, the, the Mujahideen movement in the past, and she was in prison for 13 years without one single day. What was really interesting was um, the, the, soli the solidarity among uh, women in prison in Iran was quite fascinating. So we, regardless of what background we were and what political affiliation, we had all come together with one single aim, and that was the injustice that had put us all through that. Um, and I think, as Nazanin uh, mentioned, uh, last year when the death of Masa Amini, the killing of Masa Amini happened, we have got two journalists in Iran who are kept uh, in limbo. There, is, there has been some cases, like some court cases happening, but there is no um, immediate, no clear uh, outcome of that, uh, of that court case. So this is basically like a future which is unknown to anybody who stands up for their rights in Iran. And as part of the last year's movement, as far as um, I was told by some of my uh, friends who are still in prison, the, the ward has filled up very quickly. There were so many arrests, um, arrests so many detainees coming to the, to the general ward. But also, some of them were sent out with the, um, with the fear and the threat of being sent back to prison, sent out on bail. So you are never going to get out of it. This is always going to be with you. Even if they let you out, they will make sure that they are following you as, they will be your shadow, they'll be following you, they will monitor what you do. Um, and where you go and who you meet. Um, but then again, I think in cases like this, what, what is really fascinating inside and outside prison, as my experience who has been in prison for, for a long time, the solidarity keeps women going. Uh, just standing up together. What makes them stronger is being together and having one single aim, and that is to stand up for your rights and to fight for it. Uh, and I think we all say that freedom is a gift, but sadly we live in a world that sometimes freedom is not given. Absolutely. And in a country like Iran, you have to fight for it. Absolutely. Um, these, yeah, these are heartbreaking things. Um, when you, so you, had, you went back to Afghanistan, you were establishing your life there, and then um, the Taliban brutally seized control of the country again and Kabul fell. What was that like? Um, what, is it, what is it like in Afghanistan now? But what is it also like for the diaspora? Because you know, I, I know many of you who, who live in European and, and Western nations will have been so proud to welcome the Afghan refugees that we could, but arguably it was absolutely not enough. So what is it like for the Afghan diaspora and, and the refugees as well as the people back home? Uh, hi everyone, <coughs> thanks for having me today. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say about the situation of women in Afghanistan before Taliban. Before Taliban, it was the same for women in Afghanistan. It wasn't just only Kabul, it was about many cities in Afghanistan that they, they couldn't study because of the society, because we had Taliban, you know, before they took the power. And they were fighting, they, are, they were fighting to, to have a good education, to work, to, to be independent, but they couldn't. And now, they are officially in Afghanistan and they have the power and women are not allowed even to go to public place without the man. And they can study and they can do anything. And nobody cares about them that what's happening there right now. And as a girl from Afghanistan, because I was born in Iran and I grew up there, so I'm between Iran and Afghanistan. I know how is situation there, Iran and Afghanistan. And I appreciated the fight of women in Iran and Afghanistan because uh, what they are doing, it's wow, because you need to be so brave to fight against a group of terrorists and against a group of uh, people that they are against women and they can kill you, you know, if you stand against them, if you talk against them, they can kill you and nobody can save you. So they are so brave. And there is many girls in Kabul that they were in protest and they are in prison of Taliban. And some of them, we don't know where they are. And they got killed, some of them, by Taliban. And this is what's happening right now in Afghanistan. And about the Afghan women refugees in Europe, there is many 
uh, women that they are fighting out of Afghanistan for women's rights in Afghanistan. And they are fighting for freedom, for a real freedom. I don't want to go, uh, to, go to school by the rules of Taliban. You know, we want to live without Taliban. Yeah. We, uh, it's not just to have an education with a group of terrorists, because more than 20 years, they kill people in Afghanistan by the name of Islam, Jihad, everything they call. And we don't want to live with their rules. It's not just we want to live with them. We don't want to be with them. We want to be free to have the right to choose how we want to live. It's not to living with them. This is what we should make it clear that we don't want them at all in Afghanistan because they are not part of us and they are destroying my culture and everybody thinks that we have a bad culture because of a group of terrorists. That is not true. Mm. And we are fighting against them, you know. If, uh, like, I'm a girl who is doing Taekwondo, for example. This is my fight. If you are doing what you want as a woman and you are against the rules of them, it's a fight and everybody should have this. We don't need to do something like, is not in our, you know, something that is not possible. When you are going out, just go as a free woman, you know. This is a fight. And stand for uh, what you want and what you want to achieve. This is a big fight against a society that is against women, against group of terrorists, and many people who think that women are not strong. I know I can see some of our amazing Northern Irish ambassadors here in the front row, and when we were talking to young people in Northern Ireland about what they wanted the world to know about Belfast, they said we're so much more in the, than the Troubles, and the people of Afghanistan are so much more than the Taliban. Um, Nazneen, what, what has the impact of last year's protest been? What is the situation, not just what is the situation today, but within the women's solidarity and movement in Afghanistan, excuse me, in Iran, um, what has the impact of that amazing movement been? It was you know, dubbed the first feminist movement in the region. Uh, I can talk about um, how my friends in prison oh. reacted to this, um, to this movement. So as a political prisoner, the, your strongest asset is your voice. If they take it away from you, you don't exist. That's the only thing you have. Uh, so my friends in prison, as ha has, al has always been the case when I was inside, but it has never been this extreme. So past year's um, uh, movement was probably the biggest in the history that, 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 that I remember. But we had like the uprising in November 2019 uh, for the uh, high price of uh, gas in Iran, and then there were uh, Internet was shut down for two weeks, and at the time I was inside prison. And of course, phone and telephones are the main source of communication to the outside world when you're inside prison. They cut off the phones. Um, some of the political prisoners went on a, a long sit-in as a form of protest, and they don't like it. And of course, they would um, find any way to silence them. So this, this has been occurring ever since uh, the incident of last year happened, that women inside prison would want to show solidarity with the outside, um, with the outside world and what is actually happening uh, in Iran and to condemn the brutality of the Iranian regime. So they would go through um, sit-ins, um, issuing statements, condemning what the government is doing. But then, of course, the security forces would shut them down, they would cut off the phones, they would cancel visits, and in very kind of strange, uh, extreme cases, they would also open uh, court cases against them. But that does not stop them. That is the whole point of being a political prisoner. And like I said, if, even if you were not a political prisoner coming to prison in Iran, you would come out of it as a political activist. So. The way the prison works in Iran is just everything is just so unjust. You will become a fighter the, mo yes. the moment you come out of it. You realize that, wow, all the things that I did not know, it's like a very kind of, it's like a crash course of politics if, if you're <laughs> in prison in a country like Iran. Because before that, it, it, in my case, it completely changed my life because I felt there were so many things that I did not know. Being with really amazing people in prison who have been fighting for the, um, for the women's rights, for the children's uh, rights and for everything. But, but I think what I was trying to say was um, 
w women's ward is like a mini uh, kind of version of a movement happening alongside the the um, the movement outside outside prison. And, and I think they ha I'm, I am personally very proud of them because I think it takes a lot of courage to be a political prisoner locked up, having very very minimum. Um, kind of um, limited um, access to the outside world and then knowing that if you are going to carry on, that is going to be taken away from you. Yeah, it's incredibly, incredibly brave. Um, turning to, to your professions, um, uh, Nazneen, obviously, as well as being an activist, you're, you're an actress uh, and you are one of our amazing, part of our amazing refugee Olympic team. Um, just briefly, you know, what is the importance of the entertainment industry? And then I'll come to you to talk about sport in raising awareness of these issues and creating solidarity. Um, I think, you know, for me, I've been doing this for 15 years now, my advocacy, and I think that the, the common thread between acting and ac advocacy is empathy. I always say as an actor, I get to portray the human condition, but as an activist, I hopefully get to change the human condition. Um, and again, that common thread is empathy, about caring and about storytelling, really. It's about sharing the stories of people like Nazila Marufian, who is a young female journalist, and every time she comes out of prison, despite, despite the th the, her multiple imprisonments, she'll take off her compulsory hijab and take a picture and share it with the world, despite the, the risks that are involved. Um, and, and the courage of the Iranian women, hundreds of thousands of Iranian women are currently on the streets flouting the compulsory hijab, despite the threat of harassment rape, torture, um, imprisonment, and being killed. And the stories like that of uh, Armita Geravand, who just is meeting exactly the same fate as, um, uh, as Massa Amini a year after she was killed. She's currently in a coma after being beaten by the morality police. So these are the stories that hopefully impact change and using our platform, I think, is a powerful way of storytelling and sharing these stories and hopefully impacting that change. Absolutely, and, and to sport. I mean, we've got lots of people from the Olympic refugee movement here with us. What is the importance of sport and the refugee movement? Uh, I think for me, sport, uh, of course, is a passion for me, and also is a way to have a platform to talk to the world and to show that what's happening, for example, in my country for women, and also, for me, uh, I can use the sport to show uh, the like how is a, f a girl from Afghanistan, you know, as a free girl, and also to show the different face of uh, different image of refugees and women from Middle East. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's so important to use the sport in this way more. Of course, I want to have medals. Yes. To be champion, <laughs> but for me, it's more to change something for women. Mm -hmm. This is so important for me, and I want to use the sport to build something for the refugees, for the women, and to be positive. You know. Absolutely. Um, so it is peace day at One Year World. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, um, it is peace day at One Young World, and lots of the people here are peace builders. You yourself were involved in the peace negotiations in Afghanistan. Um, what is one piece of advice that you have, and then we'll finish with some with quick comments. One piece of advice that you have if you, for the young people around the world who are trying to build peace in their countries when it comes to negotiating for peace? The one piece of information as a living experience, listen, be patient, and look at the realities on the ground. Define your own definition for peace. That is what I will say. Listen, be patient, define your own definition for peace based on the realities on the ground. That is my experience starting at the age of 15 and today at the age of 50. So this is what can help you your community, the women movement, the women solidarity, and the human solidarity. Um, and finally, these are big problems, and sometimes it's easy for us to be sitting here in somewhere like Belfast and feel quite powerless when we see these things on the news. So what is one thing that each of the audience could do, a practical thing to help actually really stand in solidarity, not just with a hashtag, not just, not just with sentiments, but with action. One Young World's about action. 
what can our audience do for, first of all, the women of, of Iran? I would say please follow uh, activists or people who are constantly doing this work um, and, you know, and, and look for the, their cues, organizations to support like the Abdul Rahman Buruman Center or the Human Rights Agency um, uh, Network, Harana, H-R-A-N-A, online. Um, uh, and, and, and really follow their work, donate to them, and amplify what they're saying, because that's, they're getting the news directly from the ground in Iran, and they're creating action impacts uh, around it. Excellent. Piece of advice for our audience today. Uh, for, I want to say that uh, let's help Afghan women, uh, because we can be there, but we can do something out of there. I think the most important is because they are banned from schools and from everything, we can give them online, edu uh, online uh, education. They, they can study online, I think, because even if they say, okay, you can go to school, but we don't want to learn what they are teaching to us because they will teach us what they learn, you know? And I think the best is to, uh, to help them and please, don't support Taliban. Absolutely. Um, Nazneen, um, one thing that our audience can be doing. Uh, I think I came home um, because people supported me. Uh, people shared my story. Sorry, I, I always get very emotional at this bit. Um, and uh, they told my story. If um, I get into a taxi and the taxi driver knows my story, and that is a great thing. If you know anyone, regardless of whether it, that person is, a pr is in prison in Iran or elsewhere, as long as you know that they are unjustly imprisoned, talk about them and tell their stories. I think one of the main things that got me home was, uh, was the, the nation caring about me as a person. And I am grateful for that. And I think one main thing that I would say is talk about them, share their story, and be their voice. Absolutely. I cannot. Yeah. Thank you. For, the, for those of you living in the UK, and for, you know, we, we, we did care about you so much and we, we kept talking about you and we were so, so, so glad when you came home. You. Um, Hasina, for the women in Afghanistan, what is something that our audience can do? The first thing is for them that don't think you are powerless, don't think you can do anything, you can do a lot because you are a human being and each human being is a high value in the world. You are the power of the world. The second thing is, think what you can do and how you can do it. Remember them and put yourself in your own, in their position. Imagine the way you are sitting here, men, women, together, young, old, everyone, enjoying. Imagine yourself in a situation that they are. And that is how you feel their pain. When you feel their pain, if you want or not, you will be thinking about them. When you think about them, you voice out their messages. The message will go from your room to your yard, from the yard to community, from the community to society, and then it will go to the political level. So influence it from the grassroots to the policy level. Don't think you are powerless and you can't do anything. You are of very high value. Put yourselves in their position. Stand with the women of Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Ella, can I, can I say one? And, and one, one final one, word to Nazneen. One final word, because it ties it together. End gender apartheid dot today. If you go to that website, website there's, an, uh, there's a call to action for all of our women, Afghan and Iranian women. Please use that word all the time, gender apartheid, because yeah, that's absolutely. what this is. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody.